Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're very excited to have you here. My name is Lisa Coleman, and I am the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at New York University. Please note that closed captioning is available and can be activated by clicking on the CC bottom at the bottom of your screen. Wow, so we have over 1,700 people who signed up to join us this evening. And given that size and our collective desire to have community engagement and participation, we're going to be collecting questions on the front end of this presentation. My team will be going through the questions to identify themes and come up uh, with the themes and common questions so we can group them together and then we'll ask the panel. We recognize that many are coming in with specific questions and this is our effort to try to address and get to as many as possible. Unfortunately, given the number of uh, attendees, we probably won't get to all of the questions submitted uh, after the first five or so minutes. However, we will be reviewing all questions as a way to help and direct future programming. And as we uh, create more resources, we'll use those as direction as well. Uh, please take a moment when you get a chance and you can start answering your questions in along the way. Before we actually begin, I'd like to take a moment to honor those people who've come before us, our ancestors and indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. I also want to honor those lives who have been lost, uh, not only in recent acts of uh, anti-Black violence, but also to our ancestors who paved the way for us to be here today. So if you could join me in 10 seconds of silence. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank uh, all of the people who are working on the front lines and scenes uh, and behind the scenes to keep us all safe. Without you, we know we couldn't be here, so thank you. Uh, sometimes we forget to uh, thank those delivery workers, the grocery, uh, people working the grocery stores, and all of those people who help us to be uh, where we are and who we are as we all shelter in place, particularly here in New York. So thank you to everyone. I hope everyone is finding ways to take good care and stay very well. Thank you, of course, to our esteemed panelists who are joining us here this evening. I can't thank you enough. I know that these are very busy people, and so I very much appreciate you being with us here as well. And then, of course, thank you to my entire team uh, in, within the Office of Global Inclusion. I always say this, without you, I'm nothing, but that is really true. There are all these people working behind the scenes right now to bring this together and have been working over this last week. Uh, some of you know uh, we put this together relatively quickly, so thank you so much for all the hard work in getting this on board. We in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation remain committed to all of our NYU partners uh, all over the world. And as we know, in many ways, uh, it seems that COVID-19 pandemic has pressed at the very existing fra fractures and the foundations of our global communities. And we're experiencing disruption across all types of um, all types of ways, but we're also experiencing the intersectional and differential impacts. Additionally, we are aware of the increased, increased media coverage, uh, particularly uh, most recently uh, foregrounding the persistent violence and racism against black people and, and sometimes other marginalized communities sparking calls to action across the nation. These incidents have obviously foregrounded all the fault lines and disparities that are not new. Uh, and not new at all, although some have uh, suggested that. So today's conversation will help us uh, foreground that. And we have some, uh, as I said, esteemed panelists who will help us uh, um, unpack that. We know that this, uh, that the, a lot of what is happening and the pressures that are happening are certainly deeply woven into our collective systems and practices within my office. We continue to uh, try to, as I said already, uh, examine these through programs like tonight. We do see that this present moment has um, assist upon the urgency of this work and all of the work that we must do to strategically realize uh, uh, anti-racism um, efforts and also to um, strengthen our communities. This program is being launched as part of a part of a new initiative here at NYU. It's our NYU Be Together initiative, and we're sending it out. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, we had an, an assessment here at NYU. Uh, and you can see it in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, we had an assessment here at NYU uh, 
voicing some concerns from students from 2015. The assessment actually took place in 2017 and 18, and we've been collecting the data. We had over 26,000 people respond, and so we were able to get a lot of information from our community about what it would mean to thrive and innovate and maximize and uh, our community maximize uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, and, and identity in our communities. And so as a, as a result, we're following up on this data. People have asked about what we're doing and what our next action steps are. So over the course of the next year, there will be lots of programs, lots of ways to engage hackathons, theater productions, solvathons, all kinds of things in an effort for us to, to um, think about our community. And as I said, this is just one such effort. As we approach the commemorations of June of Juneteenth, and it's just a position to the national uh, holiday of July 4th. We are reminded of the long legacies of black resistance, liberation movements, uh, protests, riots, revolts, and um, resistance and resilience have existed simultaneously and, multi and have been multifaceted. Whether we go back to uh, the Atlantic slave trade or on all the way today, these legacies of liberation and social transformation have been so part and such a part of the continual movements within black communities. So tonight we come here to address the urgent and con concurrent moment that has been highlighted by anti-black racism in the United States and globally. And we've seen incidents all over the world, as we know. And of course, we know that this is intersectional with gender, so socioeconomics, and of course, uh, sexual identity, as well as nationality and abilities. The history of these uh, state sanctioned violence undergirds many of the practices that continue to target uh, Black people globally. So today, we will situate the particularities of racism, the histories, um, the violence. Uh, the ways in which we're going to unpack inter and uh, racial bias and privileges and highlight the intersections with other is isms. And of course, we'll be talking about uh, these uh, the social social movements. Um, when as thinking about this, as I've said before, we um, we put together an extremely um, extremely expert panel and I'm going to go to their bios right now and talk a little bit. So our first uh, panelist is um, Kirk J. James. Sorry, I have to put on my glasses. Um, a little bit there. And let me just do this. Sorry, I have to just pull up. It's not coming up as quickly as I would want. So just give me a moment. Sorry about this. Technological difficulties. My computer decided not to uh, not to work there. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry about that. So Kirk J. James is a clinical professor at the New York Silver School, and he uh, was born in Montego Bay, Jamaica, during a period of political social unrest. He migrates to the United States at 10 years old with his mother in search of a better life, and yet the American dream, uh, like for so many. Uh, immigrants uh, became more like a mirage than a reality. And as uh, the nightmare that awaited Jay was that one in three black men between 16 and 24 become victims of what scholars would call, later would call, of course, mass incarceration. As a college student with no criminal record, uh, Jay would um, find himself um, um, dealing with the criminal system. Um, since his release, he has been a champion of immigrant rights, mass incarceration, and raising awareness of the trauma instituted by various systems of, 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 of oppression. In 2013, he completed a doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania, and where he was looking at the invisible epidemic, uh, educating social work students and holistic practice in mass incarceration. And as a professor at NYU, he utilizes firsthand knowledge to educate and um, government, community-based organizations, and others. And he has done this across the world, across America, Caribbean, and Africa. He is mostly influenced by Paulo Ferrero and Bell Hooks and their theories on critical pedagogy. And he believes in liberation, uh, education as the greatest tool for liberation and social justice. And as we, I will end by talk, just saying this, he is an outstanding scholar and uh, contributor to our NYU community. Um, and he has numerous publications including um, A History of Mass Incarceration, Social Implications for Social Work, published in 2016. He is also the um, inducted into the inaugural Alumni Hall of Fame at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Work. 
And he has also written about George Zimmerman. He's written about community corrections and deconstruction mass incarceration in the United States. So without further ado, I invite Jay to come onto the screen. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, wow, what a time. What a time. I, I'm always embarrassed by introductions as I feel the gist of my work is to put myself out of business. So the more I'm introduced, it's a reminder that I'm not doing enough to put myself out of business. Um, I want to start this conversation. Usually I come to space and I'm so excited to be in this space. This is a conversation that is now this is a conversation that is so overdue and yet i didn't have words i didn't have words I, I didn't know what else to say i didn't know what to say you know it's like we've been saying the same thing as you've just said lisa for 500 years i didn't know what else to say and what i did was i took a moment whenever i feel speechless i took a moment and i went back to the ancestors and i want to just start uh, by sharing a video and it's a video that I feel really speaks to right now and I'm going to just let it speak for itself because I feel there are two important points that come from this video that I would love for us to check in. In order for you and me to devise some kind of method or strategy to offset some of the events or re a repetition of the events that have taken place here in Los Angeles recently, we have to go to the root. We have to go to the cause. Dealing with the condition itself is not enough. And it is because of our effort toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. We are oppressed. We are exploited. We are downtrodden. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. So the only way we're going to get some of this oppression and exploitation away from us or aside from us is come together against the common enemy. Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? so much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate, you should ask yourself who taught you to hate being what God gave you. And I, for one, as a Muslim, believe that the white man is intelligent enough. If he were made to realize how black people really feel and how fed up we are without that old compromise and sweet talk, Stop sweet talking him. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how, what kind of hell you've been catching and let him know that if he's not ready to clean his house up, if he's not ready to clean his house up, he shouldn't have a house. It should catch on fire and burn down. I found that video this afternoon, Lisa, and like I, I just thought it's, it spoke to this moment more than I could ever speak to this moment. And I feel there is, there's a few questions that come from this video when I watched it. And maybe the first question is, is white supremacy redeemable? You know, and I feel that is a question that we have to ask in this moment. What we're seeing today is not new. Malcolm says, if we're going to solve this, we have to go to the root. Police, 
police brutality, police murder, and that is not the root. The history of this country is founded on brutality. The history of this country is founded on murder. We robbed the Native Americans, we murdered them. It's founded on anti-Blackness. If we don't have this truth, there can be no reconciliation. So I feel, you know, there is again, there's a question Malcolm is asking and Malcolm is asking, is white supremacy really redeemable? And I feel like we have to ask that question because this system has killed us with impunity, like killed us, murderers with impunity. And for us to continue to talk about this, we have to ask that question. I think the second question in this moment that Malcolm asks us is that, and it's the same question Baldwin asks when he says, you know, like, you have to ask yourself, why did you create a nigger? And I feel that's what Malcolm is asking America to really sit with what's in your heart. What is in your heart? that makes you need to diminish me to exalt you. And if America does not check into that question, there will always be war. You know, I, I don't feel that this has to be an academic discussion. I feel like it, it's very simple. And I think, you know, the third piece I think of is Bob Marley and Haile Selassie, whose words ring very dearly to me right now. And he says, until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all, until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes, there's going to be war. So as long as there's oppression, there's going to be war. So if we're not willing to go to the root, if we're not willing to really do the internal work, not just, you know, it's, this cannot be about, when I think of dismantling oppression, I think about decolonization. I, I think about just really showing up and realizing that our ways of knowing, our ways of being, and our ways of acting have been influenced by an ideology designed to promote white supremacy, to maintain white supremacy. So if we're not all invested in doing that inner work to really ask those deep questions, white America, black America, purple America, if we're not all you know, invested in really doing the work to go to the root, these, these are symptoms. Symptoms will never change a condition Symptoms will never change the condition. So I, I feel those are the three things that I want to say that I feel this video really speaks to right now. It really acts as a question. Again, like we need to grapple with the question. I feel it's a valid question. Is white supremacy redeemable? You know, for 500 years, people more articulate than me, people more articulate than Malcolm have spoken about the injustices that have existed in this world. And yet we're still in the same place. There was a civil rights movement yet we're still in the same place. We have to ask that question. I think the second thing is again, like are we as a people willing to truly acknowledge like the harm that has been created under white supremacy? And I feel if there is going to be reconciliation, we all need to sit with truth. So those are my thoughts of right now. I feel the ancestors have given us already the knowledge of what we need to do. This is not new. For people who are not familiar with these issues, there is so much information that is available for people to really understand the history of oppression that is America. Thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate your comments and very, very well said. And now we will move to our next panelist, Jennifer Morgan, who is a professor of social and cultural analysis and history here at NYU. Uh, Jennifer, um, uh, Jennifer is a, I just said she was a professor, sorry. Um, and she's also the author of Laboring Women, Gender and Reproduction in the Making of New World Slavery, University of Pennsylvania Press 2004, and the co-editor of Connections, History of Race and Sex in America, University of Illinois Press 2013. Her research examines the intersections of gender and race in the Black Atlantic world. And her most recent journal articles, and accounting for the most excruciating torment, the transatlantic passages in history of the present and archives of the history of racial capitalism and social text. In addition to her archival work as, an, as a historian, uh, Jennifer Morgan has published a wider range of essays on race, gender, and the process of 
doing history, most notably uh, experiencing black feminism in Deborah Gray White's volume, Telling Histories, Black Women Historians in the Ivory Tower in 2007. She is currently at work on a project that considers colonial numeracy, racism, and the rise of the transatlantic slave trade in the 17th century, an English Atlantic world tentatively entitled Accounting for Women in Slavery. She teaches courses on the history of slavery, on race and reproduction, and on the comparative feminist theory and practice. And she is a terrific partner and colleague to have here at NYU. So please join me, Jennifer. You're still muted, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. Um, I am going to share, I have just a tiny little PowerPoint slide here, um, which is that very, very narrow for you all? Or is it a full size? Can you see it, Lisa? Yes, I can see it. I can all see right. it now. It's better now. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, so I am going to read my remarks because I'm just not as good as extemporizing as my esteemed colleague, colleague Professor James is. So I'm going to read some remarks um, and I really am so grateful to be invited to be to, to participate in this conversation. Um, to seriously oversimplify an enormously complicated history, I think there are two broad ways that we can characterize the history of blackness and protest in the Atlantic world. We can see the way that since the first instance of forced um, capture and transport from the coast of Africa, uh, black people have been violated body and soul to build the economies of the Americas. We can see the history of slavery as inaugurating a history of trauma and victimization. And this isn't fundamentally wrong. But we can also see from the moment of that first horrific transatlantic voyage that Africans and their descendants have always responded to their subjugation with efforts to build and protect our communities. We need to recognize that protest has emerged right alongside the structures of inequity under which we have always labored. As a scholar of gender and slavery, I paid particular attention to the ways in which enslaved people as early as the first decades of the 16th century responded to their enslavement by assessing the terms of their captivity and devising strategies to subvert it. This could be through individual alliances, for example, with people of power, or it could be through successful collective efforts to escape from enslavement, to establish free territories called maroon communities where families were formed and arms were taken up to defend the community's integrity. There is a long and deep history of Black political thought. I want to emphasize that. Because as we watch the demonstrations that have cohered in the aftermath of the deaths of um, Ahmed Arbery, um, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, it is quite tempting to think of these as some kind of instinctual manifestation of collective rage. But for every mass gathering, there are hundreds and thousands of individuals who have been assessing and analyzing the landscape, who have been explicitly or implicitly organizing their community in order to be ready to respond. Who among, of, who among us doesn't have an elder relative who, when it started to become clear that black and brown people were dying of COVID at higher rates than white people, mused that it was now only a matter of time before white people started losing interest in containing the virus? Who among us hasn't spent our entire adult lives making sure that the young people in our families understood the potential danger posed to them by police stops for something like speeding or smoking a joint on the street? These aren't just warnings. These are the fabric of critical ideology. They are the manifestations of the roots of Black radicalism. There is a deep and long history of assessment and planning that I would argue is absolutely rooted in the time of slavery, a time at which Black people learned that to fail to pay attention was to risk intense bodily harm, both individually and collectively. When Dr. Coleman invited me to participate in this conversation, I worried, as I often do, about how a view from the dusty archives might inform the current dangers of the here and now. 
Historians committed to the long view to charting change over time before drawing conclusions might not be the one's best position to react swiftly to contemporary realities. And that may be so, but historians of slavery have been powerfully hailed by cultural theorists and activists who are increasingly committed to rooting inequities in what they are terming the afterlife of slavery. In the brilliant words of Saidiya Hartman, if slavery persists as an issue in the political life of Black America, it is not because of an antiquarian obsession with bygone days or the burden of too long memory, but because Black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery. Skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. An afterlife is more than just an echo or a gesture to where we go to after we die. It references the long continued radioactivity of nuclear isotopes and the enduring presence of something that we mistakenly thought was dead and gone. In this regard, many historians of slavery and of racial injustice in the present understand slavery as profoundly tethered to the here and now in ways that have alarmed us for years, not just since the election of our sitting president, the murders of Floyd and Taylor and Arbery, or the disparate death rates caused by COVID-19. Countering or opposing anti-Blackness requires recognizing its multiple forms. Anti-Black racism is not the same as slave ownership, but the presence of slavery lingers well after the alleged demarcation of freedom in ways that we need to think carefully about as we grapple with how communities of kinfolk have always already been transformed into non-citizens. How else do we explain mass incarceration or the separation of families at our borders or the callous presumption that denigrates Black mothers in need of public assistance or the shocking rate of Black death at the hands of those who are meant to protect us? What is this freedom? The simplicity of the formula that Black Lives Matter exemplifies the profound possibilities that emerge from political claims, claims that are rooted both in the history of injustice, the history of slavery, and in the history of making those injustices visible. Black Lives Matter only becomes a manifesto in the face of overwhelming evidence that they do not. When we watch the protests, we are seeing a deep history of recognition, of protest, of countering the narratives that say over and over again that Black lives don't matter. This perspective has long shaped the way that Black women understand the climate of white supremacy and bring an analytic clarity to efforts to oppose it. When an enslaved woman, for example, was faced with the possibility of childbirth, she fully comprehended the ways that the economic system of racial slavery was rooted in her body, and that when she called her child her own, she was making a stand against economic dominations as well as the violence of white slave ownership. In the faces of the women at the mass rallies that we've all been watching, I see a very common thread. Recently, um, Kadiatu Diallo, the mother of Amadou Diallo, who was brutally killed by the police in 1999, said of, Joy, of George Floyd's murder, quote, when George Floyd called his mama, all of the mothers were summoned to push forward and make things happen. Our strength, our strength is to really push forward the change we need because we're not going to give up, which is powerful words, powerful words, but don't get me wrong, there is a toll to be taken, and it is both collective and quite individual. It is a tax on the body as well as a cost to the community. The public health scholar Arline Geronimus has coined the term weathering to describe what racism does to the bodies of Black women, the toll it takes. She uses it to understand why it is that Black women across the spectrum of education, region, and class suffer vastly higher rates of pregnancy-related diseases, death, and infant loss than white women in this country. A Black woman is 22% more likely to die from heart disease than a white woman, 71% more likely to perish from cervical cancer, and 243% more likely to die from pregnancy or childbirth-related causes. Weathering is an evocative and complicated metaphor, one that captures 
the pervasive, enervating quality of racism. Before the COVID crisis, weathering had become a shorthand among the Black women in my community, those of us trying to care for one another, um, and we would, we would often caution uh, each other to bundle up against the weather, a tongue-in-cheek gesture towards the omnipresence of anti-Blackness that is, in the words of cultural critic Christina Sharp, as pervasive as climate. What is weathering now? How will we recover from yet another instance in which Black people are treated as though we are not citizens, not worthy of care, not worthy of protection or of futurity? Well, one thing I know for sure is that the radical demand for equality and justice will continue, demands for equality and justice will continue as they are woven into the fabric of our communities. So I have just one more thing and then I'm, and then I'm done. Um, Christina Sharp also offers this. She asks, what? Let me get back to the, my quotes, because I know sometimes it's hard. I read so fast. I know that. What is the word for keeping and putting breath back in the body? What is the word for how we must approach the archives of slavery? The word that I arrived at for such imagining and for keeping and putting breath in the Black body in hostile weather is aspiration. Aspire. To breathe. And this is a start. But let's be clear, in Sharp's formula formulation, it is something much more than the directive to be calm and breathe in a kind of meditated stillness. To simply breathe, as Eric Garner, George Floyd, Derek Scott, and Manuel Ellis, the last two names are probably less familiar to you now, but maybe not for long, as they all show, simply breathing has become transformed by the afterlife of slavery into a deeply political act. But also, to aspire is to direct one's hopes or ambitions towards achieving something. Aspiration, then, is the breath and the goal. The protests that we see now are that aspiration. They are the collective demand of Black Americans that we must have the space to breathe and that we will aspire to something more than what the legacies of slavery have suggested are possible, because we've always seen that there is more possibility there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for those comments. And uh, we'll come back to some questions in a little bit. Our next panel panelist is uh, Timothy McCarthy. Uh, Tim McCarthy joins us from Harvard University, where he serves as a lecturer in history and literature and public policy and education, and uh, core faculty of the Carr Center for uh, Human Rights Policy. He's an award-winning scholar and educator and public servant and social justice activist who has taught on the faculty at Harvard since 2005. His, his work has been shaped by the anti-apartheid and AIDS activism of his co early college years, and he's devoted his life to public service and social justice. As I already said, I talked about his uh, appointments, but he's located in the Janice uh, Kennedy School of Government, um, and he is, sorry, and he's also, uh, sorry, with the Graduate School of Education. He is also the Stanley Patterson a pro Professor of American History in the Boston Clemente Course, a college humanity course for low-income adults and co-recipient of the National Humanities Medal. He was the founding member of Barack Obama's National LGBT Leadership Council and gave expert testimony in, to the Pentagon Comprehensive Working Group on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the LGBTQ delegation from the US to Israel and Palestine and currently serves as the board, uh, board chair for Free the Slaves, a leading global anti-slavery NGO. He hosts and directs the ART, American Repertory Theater, Human Rights and Resistance Mike at the, tour, at the uh, Tony Award winning theater. And he, he is also a board member. He's a noted historian of politics. Uh, he's published five books with the New Press, including The Radical Reader, Prophets and Provost, and the forthcoming Stonewall's Children, Living Queer, History in an Age of Liberation, Loss, and Love. And Tim is my former colleague from Harvard University, so it's a pleasure to have him join us here today. Tim, please join us. Thank you, Lisa, Dr. Coleman. It's uh, really an honor to be here. I um, was incredibly moved by your invitation to come and be with you today to be called into this discussion. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in these last several weeks and months thinking about the reckoning that we are all a part of and trying to think about what role I can play or what roles I can play to be useful. And one of those roles is to not always be centered. 
um, and um, part of the talking. I'm doing a lot more listening and reading and learning and witnessing these days than talking, but um, it's an honor to be with such an esteemed group of folks. And um, I've already learned a lot from listening to my colleagues, Professor James and Professor Morgan. Um, so let me just say um, a couple of things and then I'll, I'll step back. Um, the first is that I really do believe that we are living in one of those profound reckoning moments nationally, certainly within the United States, um, but with world historical implications. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by that and I wanna kind of connect those dots just initially to mark that. I also wanna pick up, it's, you know, I didn't know what, what Professor James and Professor Morgan were gonna talk about, but it's interesting because what I'm gonna say really connects to, to, to one piece of each of their presentations. One is the, the sort of getting to the root of things, like what is the root of this? And then to think also about the profound interrelationship, which is sometimes a contradiction and sometimes a convergence and sometimes um, something else between the deep histories of oppression and exploitation, extraction, subordination, enslavement, et cetera, and the histories of freedom struggles, of the aspirations to equality and to freedom and to human rights and human dignity. And as you know, Dr. Coleman, I've spent my whole career as a historian and as a, an activist and a teacher trying to think about histories of radicalism histories of protest. And my, my late mentor, uh, Howard Zinn, taught me that radicalism by definition at its core is getting to the root of things. Too often we think about radicalism as something that is on the margins and sometimes it is, often it is, uh, as something bad as a threat that needs to be contained or policed or subdued or vanquished. And yet, if you think about radicalism and its true definition, it means going to the root of things, getting at the root of the problem or the root of the truth. And that's how I've always understood protest movements and social justice movements as expressions of human anger, anguish, aspiration, and other things that are trying to get to the root of the problem and of the truth of the nation, of the world, of any particular community. And so when I think about protest and radicalism, particularly the kind of progressive types of radicalism that I've spent much of my career studying and teaching and trying to understand and participating in, is that protest is always something that is going to be a threat to the system. Right? I hear, it's so interesting right now, you're hearing people talk about the system, systemic racism and systemized white supremacy and these kinds of things, talking about the system. And some people say, the system's broken totally broken. We can't fix it. We can't reform it. We can't change it. It's broken. Burn it down. And then other people are saying, no, 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 the system's exactly as it should be. It's working perfectly fine. It was set up to work this way. And in, in, in a sense, radicals, right, the protesters who are trying to get the root of things are actually saying it's both, right? The system is broken if you come from a justice framework. If your ideal world, if your aspiration to a world of justice and dignity and freedom and equity and so forth, uh, a redistribution and a sharing of resources, et cetera, if that's your vantage point, then the system is broken, right? But if you are, as so many people are, black people in particular in this moment, and I wanna be specific about this moment as an anti-black moment and also an expression of black freedom struggles, which is so profound, that you know, if you're on the downside of that system that is broken, right, you understand in the long game, in the long history that that system was set up that way from the very beginning. I was just revisiting something from the late 18th century and Professor Morgan I'm sure knows this history better than I do, um, but I was going back to the Philadelphia yellow fever pandemic. And this was a moment, may seem obscure, a moment where the yellow fever had sort of overtaken Philadelphia. It was a pandemic. People were, you know, uh, 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 Benjamin Rush and, and, and Anthony Benazit and a number of people who are physicians and Quakers and other activists were, were concerned about what it was doing. And one of the things that happened in the dynamic of that is that they called in African-Americans, nurses and other volunteers and essential workers because they thought that they had a greater immunity to the yellow fever. 
And there were other people in, the, in, the, in Philadelphia at the time, most infamously Matthew Carey, who was a printer and a publisher, who published a pamphlet that basically said, oh, no, 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 it's the immigrants from Saint-Domingue. It's the African and black immigrants who are coming to Philadelphia who brought this with them. And yet there are also these black folks in Philadelphia, free black people, many of them, who are immune to this. And so on the one hand, there's a raising up of the specialness of black people and also a, a, a scapegoating and then policing and denigration of black people in the context of that pandemic. And you see it all there. You see the policing and surveillance of black bodies and black people, how certain black lives are elevated and the rest of black lives are marginalized and denigrated how black people were, turns out, weren't immune, especially to this pandemic and died in droves as well. And the way in which black people were essential workers at the front lines of that pandemic in 1793. And this was also the time where in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, they were building the first jails and penitentiaries. So this goes all the way back, but so do black freedom struggles. So do those radical struggles and those formations of protest. Matthew Carey publishes the pamphlet totally racist, white supremacist stuff, classic stuff. And then Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, two black, free black leaders who are major leaders in the movement who are some of the originators of the immediatist radical abolitionist movement, because black folks were the ones who came up with the idea of mediatism, not gradualism when it came to slavery, not white people like Garrison, right? It was a whole generation or two of black people that came up with that idea right, early on, and that was a black freedom struggle that originated right at the birth of the nation, right, that then goes through. And so I've been thinking a lot about those things and the intertwining of the kind of, of all of these systems of oppression, of anti-black racism, of the ways in which black people are exploited and extracted and subordinated and policed and placed under surveillance and killed. And that these systems that are also coinciding with these freedom struggles and these protest articulations and aspirations are intertwined throughout the history. I've been thinking about this moment in context, right? And I'm thinking about the ways in which someone asked me this the other day, a Turkish journalist asked me the other day to, to say, why, why now, why this? And I said, well, every movement needs a, 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 has a moment, a spark, right? The lynching of Emmett Till, right? The election of Donald Trump, the passage of the fugitive slave law, right? the murders and torture and lynchings of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and George Floyd. The spark, the moment that turns into a mobilization that then can create a movement that then needs momentum. When I think about social movements and protests, I always think about those four M's, the moment, the mobilization, the movement and the momentum, and we need all of that. And this journalist asked me, why this moment, why now? And I said, well, think about the, de the context, the immediate context of eight minutes and 46 seconds of a video taped, documented torture and murder of George Floyd. And then you think about not just those eight minutes and 46 seconds, you think about the three months of the COVID pandemic, which has placed into sharp, sharp, sharp relief and illumination all of the pre existing injustices and inequalities disproportionately burdened in the lives of African Americans who are, who are on the front lines as essential workers who are getting sick and dying in disproportionate numbers, right? The systemic racism and white supremacy and anti-Black violence of a society, right, has been placed into sharp illumination and relief in the COVID crisis. Three months we've been inside, but we've also been outside, and this is doing damage and shining a light. Then you take those three months and you go to the three and a half years of Trump and his presidency, where every single day is another articulation of anti-Black racism and xenophobia and white supremacy and authoritarian dictatorial tendencies. And you have those three and a half years. And then you have 400 plus years, four plus centuries of this longer history of anti-Black racism and white supremacy that's just been cooked into and baked into the system of the nation long before it ever came into existence. This is a prehistory which Professor Morgan, of course, has written brilliantly about. And this is one of those moments where all of that is coming to a head which is what makes this moment special in my mind, right? This is also a moment where the nation, some of us have been having conversations about the 1619 Project, 
right, of the New York Times, have been having conversations about Just Mercy and Brian Stevenson's work, have been having conversations about uh, 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 Khalil uh, Muhammad's work and Michelle Alexander's work and Elizabeth Hinton's work and Angela Davis's work and all of these people who are doing this work to document all of this history and how it bears down as a burden on the present that has now exploded into a reckoning that has shaken us to our core as a nation that has world historical possibilities. And so the last thing I'll say, and I'll shut up, is that I think there's a lot of grounds for momentum that this movement and mobilization that we're witnessing, this, 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 this moment mobilization movement that we're seeing emerge and continue, right, has momentum. And we can talk more about that if you want. But I just want to say that I, I hope that we, and I'm trying to do this, resist the temptation to compare and contrast what is emerging now as this reckoning, finally, with what came before. Because those com comparisons and contrastings are never neat and easy because movements are messy and they evolve over time. So instead of comparing and contrasting, say what's happening now to the civil rights movement or the abolitionist movement or other expressions of the black freedom struggle, which are glorious and profound and prophetic, let us instead let that history, that long history inform us and help us to evolve in the midst of the fire this time. keep forgetting to unmute myself. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Sorry, Dr. McCarthy. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. And now we shall turn to our final panelist, Dr. Christina Greer. Dr. Christina Greer is an associate professor of political science at Fordham University, the Lincoln Center campus. She uh, is the author of Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream. Her research and teaching and focus on American politics, Black ethnic politics, urban politics, quantitative methods, Congress, New York City, and New York State politics, campaigns, and elections, and public opinion. She is currently writing her second manuscript and conducting research on the history of all African Americans who have run for executive office in the US, as well as working uh, as the host and producer of The Aftermath with Christina Greer on Ozzy.com. And uh, let me just say this, as we know, for those of us who watch uh, television, we get to see Chrissy commenting quite a bit. And we also get to see her, um, her articles and uh, videos as well. So thank you so much for agreeing to join us. I know you're very busy. And so we're very pleased to have you join us here today. And also, for those of you who don't know, uh, she's also served as a fellow in our McSilver Institute in the Silver, uh, in the Silver School. So we've been fortunate to have her as part of our uh, faculty as well. So with that, I turn it over to you, Chrissy. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I, I just want to thank you and your staff for putting this together. Uh, obviously, you know, you're brilliant and everyone knows that, but you know, part of being brilliant is actually putting together a team of people who have strong talents. And I really appreciate uh, everything that they've done to make this event happen. Um, so these are hard conversations that it seems like many people in the nation are just now starting to have and willing to have. Um, some of us are like, oh, welcome to the party, it's 2020. Uh, and it's somewhat frustrating for some because we have been marching in the streets. Um, we know that black people have seldom gotten anything from this nation without protest politics, which has turned into electoral politics and policy change. And so we welcome the new allies and we welcome the people who have just now decided that this is a moment where we are at a crossroads in our democracy and they have to speak up and they have to stand out. So I commend them for joining us. I do think that when we have quiet moments of reflection, we need to think about why it is that the murders of Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice and Eric Garner and Sandra Bland and the countless other hundreds of uh, Black Americans, in particular Black trans Americans, um, fell, fell on deaf ears. I mean, I don't want to use that phrase, but fell on uh, a non-responsive uh, America and why that was and why this moment, and this moment is different and it feels different for a reason because we've never had a uh, sustained protest across 50 states in this nation. We've never had the backdrop of a global pandemic that has hit home so tragically where over 110,000 plus Americans have died and counting. We've never had 40 million plus Americans 
uh, filing for unemployment. We know that several Black and Latinx and Indigenous people aren't even eligible for those unemployment benefits. So this is the moment that we're, we're beginning this conversation. And we can't stop just because of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. Those were just in one particular week. We also do have to remember, Ahmaud Arbery came to our attention during the same week of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. But keep in mind, he was murdered two months ago, two plus months ago. And it's because of activists and organizers in Georgia and Atlanta particularly that we even know about him. So we always have to remember the countless other Black and Latinx and Indigenous people whose names we can't even memorialize because they don't get the media attention uh, that they deserve. And so the the passion that I'm feeling, the passion that we're seeing across the country is because the inequity uh, that has existed in this country is part of what I tell my students all the time. It's a four-legged table that has been the foundation of America. And it's this table that they have set. The framers uh, set this table explicitly and deliberately. And it is a table that is predicated on white supremacy, anti-Black racism, patriarchy, and capitalism. Now, the occupant of the White House right now perfectly encapsulates those four legs of the table of white supremacy, anti-Black racism, patriarchy, and capitalism. We have to also recognize that white supremacy is not the same as anti-Black racism. White supremacy is trying to uphold this idea that whites are better than others. But anti-Black racism is something very specific and explicit, and it has to do with Black Americans for 401 plus years. And it is something that we're seeing, as Malcolm X says, to go back to my, my colleague's uh, previous presentation, when the chickens come home to roost, it's because there has been this dichotomous relationship since the inception of this nation that has to do with Black people being subjugated by whites. And we are now at a crossroads as to how will we sort of circle this square? How will we figure out what inequity means? We have had generations of inequity in education, in housing, in health, in health care, in public health, in environmental racism. We can put all of those things together. We can look at Brown v. Board in 1954. We can think about how the GI Bill was allocated to white soldiers when they came back from the war and they were given money to go to universities where black soldiers were. They were given money to buy homes in areas where black soldiers weren't even given the GI Bill to buy homes. They were also given money to buy homes in areas that were redlined so black soldiers couldn't even buy homes in particular areas. They were relegated to areas that usually had some sort of environmental repercussions or areas that were devalued by banks if they could even get a loan from a bank. So we don't need to go back to 1619 to have these conversations, although we should. We can go back to how FDR, the great FDR, and how he celebrated for all that he has done. Well, all things in American democracy are predicated on compromise. And we know that he had to make compromises with Republicans in the South and also people within his own party. And so what did he do? He decides that when he's thinking about social security benefits, we'll just take out domestics. Seems simple enough, except for the fact that at the time, roughly 95% of domestics were black women. So therefore we have 90 years later, an inadequate system of generational wealth based on policies that were made deliberately and explicitly. And so we have to be honest with ourselves about all the choices that have been made in our American political imagination have been specific choices that have had in the undercurrent of anti-Black racism. And for us to not have an honest conversation, we can't really have a conversation. So we've been having this surface conversation. And this is why I love being a professor. This is why I'm so honored to be a professor is because so many of us, I think older generations have been willing to prune this rotten tree that is American democracy because we were told and we are invested. We know black people are the biggest patriots ever because we keep coming back to invest ourselves into a country that has never shown us love. We have absolutely every right to fear whites and not the other way around. But we thought that if we just prune this tree to make it beautiful, to make it grow, then something would happen. And we're now seeing as people have taken to the streets over the past 13 days, they realize that we can no longer prune this tree. This tree needs to be uprooted. Now, we can have a series, this is another panel that you all can put together about whether or not, what happens when we rip that tree from the root? Institutions are built in this nation for a reason because they're stable and they endure. So can we ever work to change the institution of anti-Black racism, the institution of white supremacy, the institution of capitalism, and the institution of patriarchy? I don't have the full answers for that, but I think that these are questions that we are now 
faced with and confronted with. And there's been a quick about face by so many corporations and individuals to say, wow, I think because of the president, because of the backdrop of a white nationalist in the highest office of the land, because we've seen partisanship really erode what democracy could be, because we've seen the Supreme Court abdicate five members, abdicate the responsibilities as neutral actors, many people who care about this nation, Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike, realize that something has to change in the way that we have treated Black people over time. And so I didn't even get into pay and equity, and we can get into that um, uh, in the Q&A. But I think that as we make these demands and as we make changes, we have to remember that when our protest politics translates into electoral politics and policy changes, we have to also remember that as we have conversations about defunding the police, as we have conversations about how we will make restitution for some of these institutions that have poorly treated Blacks, right? Not just universities, we're talking about corporations that consistently in covert and overt ways uh, marginalize Black people specifically and explicitly. How do we figure out when we're putting together budgets in our state houses, which are the most important entities, I think, right now, a budget is a moral document that Joe Biden always says, and it is, because how we choose to allocate our money and our resources really tells everyone within our democracy how you feel about them. If we invest more money in prisons than education, we're letting our citizens know that that's how we feel they should be, uh, be treated. And so in this idea of participatory democracy, I think far too many people across the nation, across all 50 states, have said, we have a democracy. And we can talk about 2008 when people patted themselves on the back after Barack Obama was elected president uh, and thought that that's what democracy meant. And they put, the, they put our democracy in a frame and they put it on a wall and they looked at it and they smiled and they said, we did it. But that is not what democracy is. Democracy is a series of daily, like daily decisions that each individual who buys into the collective, e pluribus unum, out of many, there are one. That's on your currency. You see it every day if you use cash, right? But every single person has to be invested in the democracy for it to work. And we can't rest on the fact that for many, but not all, it's been a democracy and that was good enough. And so the moment that I think a lot of people are feeling right now is that we don't have much longer to pretend that we don't have a problem in this nation. We don't have much longer to watch yet another black man or black woman or black child be murdered on camera by the state or by a vigilante who is accepted by the state for his or her behavior. We have no, we cannot, continue to do that and consider ourselves a democracy. We've already seen the international community leave us behind. They're forming coalitions without us. And so I think that we're on uh, a unique moment in our history that we've never seen before of black leadership in coalition with Latinx, indigenous, LGBTQ+, and so many other allies who have skin in the game. And we have to remember, we can think about Heather Heyer in Charlottesville who was killed by a vigilante who mowed her down, a white girl who came to show her support for Black Lives Matter. We've seen countless pictures, not just 75-year-old white men, not just 25-year-old white girls who have died from an asthma attack because of pepper spray. We've seen people shot with rubber bullets, arrested and attacked, purely for marching peacefully to say that a Black life does matter. This isn't a radical statement, right? This isn't, I'm not saying Black lives are better than everyone else, it's just, can they matter? Question mark. And clearly, something in this country uh, has made it such that there is a confusion and a real obstinance to ever wanting to, to face that, that question and make it a reality. So I'll leave with this. As we move forward with this conversation, because I like sort of action steps, we have to allow ourselves a radical reimagination of what this nation can be. I think that there's a comfort in a status quo, especially during a time of crisis, especially during a pandemic. But we no longer have that luxury. We have to reimagine every institution that we've built, we can unbuild. And so I oftentimes think about Thomas Jefferson. I sit there and read the Federalist Papers and the writings of our framers often, just because I'm fascinated by what they thought. They didn't think that I would ever be included in the conversation. But when I think about Thomas Jefferson writing a letter to a friend, and it's about the possible abolition of slavery in 1820, 
sort of conversation. And he says, we have the wolf by the ears, right? And it's either justice or self-preservation. And I'm so afraid to ever let this wolf go by the ears because what will the wolf do when I let it go, right? And so we have this conversation when it comes to changing the way we thought about our prisons. And we've also had this conversation about how we've thought about black people and how they've been treated in this country. Black people are not asking for revenge, luckily for many. They are only asking for equality. That's it, that's the basic premise. And so I'll leave, I'll end with this. There's oftentimes, if you've ever been to a protest, no justice, no peace. And I think what we've seen over the past few weeks is that so many Americans have been able to enjoy peace even though a percentage of Black Americans especially and other Americans have never seen justice. They've never seen equality. And I think what people are saying now is, you do not get to have peace until we get justice. That's the moment we're in, and now we have to figure out what justice looks like, because the peace will not come until that is rectified. I'll end there. Thank you, Chrissy, very much. So uh, if all our panelists would join me back on screen, we're gonna start with some questions. And uh, I have some questions, but I see that we have lots of questions from the audience, so I wanna make sure we get to those questions. Um, and so they're coming in little by little. Thank you. All right, so let's get started with some, the first question that, uh, and so um, I, have, I had a question like this, but this is actually from the audience. Um, uh, many of you touched on, right, the historical trauma, right? So the trauma across time and space. And so, um, so I have a question here, which is a little bit about how do we address the traumas, right? I mean, J Jennifer, you talked about, right, about the implications for Black women, for instance, right, on maternal health and the legacies of today. Um, Jay, you talked, right, about the um, ways in which the carceral system, right, and the, and the legacies of that, both historically, but in this contemporary moment, and drawing back to the, the words of Malcolm X, right? Tim, you, of course, talked a lot about um, how we think about these protest movements, how they're shaped and remapped, and um, often, right, uh, the, the the trauma of a protest is then right suggested that the trauma is put upon somebody else right as opposed to recognizing the trauma that the protesters are actually expressing right um, and uh, and Dr. Greer Chrissy you also talked right about sort of where we are now and I thought it was interesting when you said right we're looking for equality not revenge, right? And so these, these, these protest moments, right, about the expression of where we are and, and, and then this expression of where we wanna go. So if you could talk a little bit about the trauma, but also each of you about then where we wanna go as um, to move out, to move around and through it. And um, I will let you all decide who wants to go first. I saw Jennifer come off mute first, so. Okay. Morgan. <laughs> So I, so I started my, um, my thoughts with like, with, with um, contrasting trauma and protest. And I think that that, I mean, I did use that caveat that this is massively oversimplified. Um, and I guess I just want to, you know, cover myself a little bit to say, I, I want, I think that we need to recognize that trauma does not preclude our capacity to collectively engage in critical political thinking and strategizing. And that's my emphasis here today is to say, like, I don't, I, I want us, I think that um, Dr. Greer's points about what it means to, to what, it, what does it mean to deal with the legacies of American democracy? This is, this is, this is the question and it is a burning question and it has been smoldering for a very long time and and we are at a crucial moment in which we have to we can really ask that question we can really force that question um and and we do so like through and with and alongside the damage that has been done to ourselves individually and collectively. And, and I, I, I tend in my teaching and in the way that I think and write to, to, to weigh on the side of, of the roots of black radicalism and, and, of, and of black engagement and political thought. But 
I understand, I do that in my own work, but I understand that there's an enormous amount of attention that we need to be paid to what, what has been produced by these legacies of, of trauma and violence. So. I can jump in, Lisa. Go ahead. So I, I um, this is a piece that I'm very much want to speak about. I feel that I think about trauma in a bifocal way, meaning I think about trauma and I think about, about our Yet we have to really sit and honor the impact of trauma. Our understanding of trauma comes from war. Our understanding of trauma comes from war. And we have been in a war for 500 years. And there's no way to really even speak about what that impact is. But we know there's an impact. And I feel, um, you know, Dr. Greer, Dr. Morgan spoke about the impact of trauma in our communities. And, you know, we are disproportionately impacted for everything bad. So if we are the instruments of our liberation, right, our liberation is not going to come about as a result of a system, but it's going to come about as a result of us and our capacity to show up for this work, then we have to recognize that trauma, not post, right, there's nothing post, so trauma, like disrupts our bodily function. And that's why we are at the greatest risk for diabetes and just every health disparity. But trauma also disrupts our minds, right? A, a tool that we're going to really need for this work. And um, I say that with, you know, like great honesty, because I have had to witness in the last two weeks, my brother, who is one of the most brilliant people that I know, have a mental breakdown from trying to exist in a moment where his very existence feels to be threatened everywhere. And that's real. So I, I feel that we have to honor trauma if we're going to create spaces that are going to build resilience. And so I feel like as heavy as these moments are, we have to find joy. We have to find you know things that make us feel whole, things that make us feel happy. And those and you know, Audrey Lord said self-care is an act of political resistance. And I feel like we need to honor that now more than ever, because if not, like it won't be the system that destroys us. We'll destroy ourselves. You know, our bodies will destroy ourselves. Our minds will destroy ourselves. So we, we must find that balance, but we also should understand that we are a people with great resilience. We come from great strength. So it's not just, again, the trauma, we should know that we have immense resilience. You know, we come from people so strong. And, and I, I feel just even that knowledge alone is something that fuels me in a time that often feels overwhelming. Thank you, Jay. Who's jumping in next? I, I will, um, Tim, if, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I, I agree with, with you, Jay, completely. I mean. I've been practicing uh, radical self-care during this moment and during several moments, um, just because, you know, I just wrote a column last week that said, you know, when you travel, the flight attendant says in the beginning, make sure in case of emergency, you put your own oxygen mask on yourself first before you assist others, right? And that's what we have to do sometimes. And I think for a lot of black people in communities, we see a crisis, we see an emergency, and we, we go to it, but we forget to put on our own masks first. Double entendre, we're in the, the era of masks right now, but our own oxygen masks for our own safety and survival. But as Jennifer was talking, I was thinking, you know, the, the one, the one uh, issue I didn't hear you talk about were fibroids. And that's something that sort of makes me think about across class with Black women and how we hold in. We hold everything together, we hold it up, we also hold it in. And so for me in this moment moving forward, I think the recognition of it and the honesty of it can help us figure out how we need help. And I think that there's oftentimes this idea that you know this black strong woman narrative, we see it with trust black women. You know, I've written about black women when it comes to voting are the canaries in the mine. They tell us what is going to happen. We told everybody about this political moment. Um, but we're holding up our, we are literally the keepers of the Democratic Party and the democracy simultaneously. 
what must that feel like to be black women in this country to know that you are the keeper of democracy and a whole entire party and mm -hmm. so and that's just women. And then thinking about Lisa and Jennifer, your colleagues were, and, and Jay, your colleagues work, Michael Lindsay at the McSilver Institute, mm -hmm. who talks about young boys and suicidal ideologies and how that translates from such a young age and how they're thinking about themselves in a world that tells them that they're nothing and that they actually don't matter. And sadly, the media will show images of black death without ever thinking, what must that look like for a, a black person, let alone black child, but a black person is eight minutes and 46 seconds. I have not watched the video. No, I stopped I watching those videos a long time ago. But even the audio clips that so many outlets feel so free, and I understand some people need to see it, some people need to hear it, but why? Why is that necessary? I don't need to hear a black man screaming for his deceased mother as he takes his last breath for me to understand what this country is and what it's done. I don't need to see Tamir Rice shot in under two minutes by the police. I don't need to see those images anymore because I know that they are changing the cells in my body. They are changing my composition from that collective trauma. And then going to work and having microaggressions or more in white institutions. So that is something that in the honesty, I think, this is what makes me inspired about this moment, as long as there's some protections uh, for black people. But a lot of people want to have honest conversations and I think they have to recognize they're going to hear some things about themselves that, make, that might make them feel uncomfortable. They may be Amy Cooper and not even realize it. They mm. may be Karen, mm. right? When you want to talk about Karen, you're Karen. This is mm. why I haven't said anything. And so I think those are going to be the hard things, but we also have to make sure we create the space for people to have these conversations without any repercussions, because I'm never going to have an honest conversation with you if, if you're the one who's writing my check. Yeah. And I know that your feelings will get hurt. So I think that before we move forward with all these corporations and, you know, all these great diversity meetings that people want to have, I think that we have to be honest about the institutional structures that have upheld these divisions. And we've, we have lots of black people in high places, but can you say anything without penalty? And that's where the rubber is gonna hit the road as we move forward. Thank you. We're, we're, I was gonna ask a question about decolonizing, but Chrissy, you've already started to get us there. So Tim, you wanna, you wanna chime in a little bit and I'll move to our next question. Yeah, let me just, I, I just wanna sit with all of that and just add one thing is that I, I something that, um, said earlier was about the so often when people think about some people think about protests and protesters um, not just that they're a threat to something but that to think about people who come to protest particularly black people who are coming to protest in this moment as coming with all of what my colleagues have been expressing so that it's not just, and I think too often white people in particular, I want to name that, think that, oh God, they're angry, or they're angry again, without understanding any of that, any understanding of the multi-generational trauma, any understanding of what it takes to get to the protest again, right, when someone might be there for the first time, right? The newly woke. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time talking about people who just woke up and are having an amazing breakfast these days, white people who are like new to the game. And, and I'm spending a lot of time talking to folks about like what, why they need to do everything all at once and why they're not paying attention to the multi-generational trauma and power of what has produced this moment. And then the last thing I'll say is I just think that our national myths, and Professor Greer talked about this, I think the myths of America, which are all lies and fictions um, about progress that allow for the nation and its institutions and white people in particular to run away from the past, to get as much distance from the root of things as possible, and then to just forget the inconvenient stuff that doesn't map onto a really neat teleology of progress. That is that erasure and that forgetting and that running away is all the stuff of trauma. It's what produces it. So I just wanna 
name that. Leads actually into my next question, and it just goes back to something that Dr. Greer said about the four-legged stool, right? And that four-legged stool starts with white supremacy, or not starts, but it's one of the legs, I guess I should say. And so I'm wondering, um, as you all have noted, right, some people are new. They've just realized that perhaps racism or black death or the spectacle of black death, as Dr. Greer talked about, is, uh, is with us and not going away. So can you all talk a little bit about, and any, anybody, and maybe not everyone has to talk or you know, whoever wants to talk, uh, can someone talk a little bit about what we see as a, a plan? Um, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, there have been lots of statements, lots of solidarity, lots of allyship, a lot of that. But um, I'm wondering what the plan is, right? Do, um, do people have a plan? Because it seems like uh, people of color, indigenous people, black people, women, et cetera, you know, we've been coming up with plans and ideations and innovations, et cetera, uh, but our plans don't always, right, as Dr. Greer and Dr. Morgan, Dr. James, and Dr. McCarthy have all said. So um, uh, does anybody have any thoughts about what that plan, where my head, I, 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 see, some, I see some hands, so uh, uh, Jay, you want to go first again, or first this time, and then we'll come back. So well, I, I'm going to be really quick, and I want to just piggyback off something Dr. Greer just said, and I feel in relation to the plan, I, I feel that we have to talk about capitalism. We have not talked about capitalism yet. Dr. Greer alluded to that, but the reality of capitalism, especially for universities, right? The reality of capitalism for businesses, the, the reality of capitalism for us right, has to be a part of that conversation. So I don't know what the plan is, and I'm sure Dr. Burr is a lot more informed and will say something totally a lot more articulate than I can, but I, I, I must say, though, that capitalism and its role in perpetuating and maintaining white supremacy, anti-racism, anti-Blackness, everything, right, needs to be part of the conversation. Agreed. I'm sorry I didn't name the other parts of the stool. I, they're equally as important. Chrissy, you want to, uh, Dr. Greer, you want to go next? Yeah. Well, I mean, going over what Jay says, you know, Jay, I have a running joke that, you know, as, as someone who's been institutionalized since I was four years old, right, um, because I went to school and now I'm, I'm in an institution, um, I always joke that universities are real estate agents that happen to teach kids on the side. And that's all across the country. And so we have to also be honest about the role that universities play when we think about Columbia, my alma mater, NYU being the number two and number three largest landowners in the city of New York. What does that do to communities uh, when NYU or Columbia wants a building or when Penn wants a building or when Brown wants to expand or UCLA? I mean, capitalism is definitely part of that. But I think Lisa, uh, you know, as, as someone who puts together robust programming and you take your position very seriously as a very necessary position, I have to say, I'm sitting this one out. I'm not joining one more committee of diversity super friends. I'm tired of being on these committees where it's always the people who care. Give me all the blacks, Latinx, the, uh, the few indigenous, the Asian folks who care, the LGBTQ folks, the down white women, and then nobody else who doesn't want to be there, they don't participate. Yeah. That's it. Wow. And so then we're doing all this heavy lifting. I'm tired of the heavy lifting. You all lift something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Done. Like, you come to the table, you tell me what the plan is, mm -hmm. then we can figure it out. But mm -hmm. I have been carrying this in institutions from, from middle school on these, I was in the BSA in middle school. I am exhausted. And what we're seeing in the streets, Black people are tired. That's why we're like, allies, come on. I'm sorry you got pepper sprayed. I'm sorry you got shot with rubber bullets. I'm sorry you were fearing for your life. I'm sorry that these things are happening to you, but welcome to the day in the life. Mm -hmm. a black person in America. Mm -hmm. Are you scared? Yes. These police officers are wiling out and you didn't do anything. Welcome to having a PhD and being a black woman walking down the street, minding my business. So I think the plan is white folks get to work. You created the problem. I didn't. I didn't create white supremacy. I didn't create racism. And the only way we're going to move past this is if white people put some skin in the game. And that's the thing. We've always had white people who had some skin in the game, but there have been far too many who were like, listen, I'm one of the good ones, but you know, my mother, my father, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, everybody else, they're terrible. But me, I'm good. It's like, you do the heavy lifting. You talk to them. You explain to them how it is to be an ally to me, because they're not going to listen to me. And until you do that work, 
I don't know where we go. You don't get peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Greer. Dr. Morgan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to, two points. First of all, I think we can, we have to name capitalism as what it is, which is racial capitalism. The, that, that capitalism develops the idea of long distance extractive trade develops in the 17th century alongside of settler colonialism and slave labor. Like that is at the root of capitalism. If we don't understand the particulars of that, we're not gonna be able to offer alternatives. But having said that, my God, Chrissy, <laughs> yes, that's all I'm gonna say. Like you can't ask the few of us who are, who are in the institution to do all of the work because we, you wanna talk about weathering? We are weathered. We are weathered and we are simply trying to breathe. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Dr. McCarthy, would you like to say something? Yeah, I, uh, much of that very deeply resonates because I'm on all those committees too here um, and I can't stand to be on another one. Um, but I also, you know, I have different skin in the game in this moment. And so as a white skinned person, who has no possessive investment in that whiteness and who has tried to be show up and speak up and do the work for a long time. I'm spending an enormous amount of time trying to intercept folks. When I see people asking my black colleagues and friends and family members for book recommendations, I'm like, come with me. Come with me. I've I have the I have the bibliographies. I know how to Google. I can teach you how to Google because we all have Google and that, that that's helpful in this moment. And trying to do some of that work, I just yesterday had a moment where a black female student of mine who's straight and cis posted that she was posted something that a white cis gay man, I knew both of them, had published and it said, I used to support Black Lives Matter, I can't anymore and now that they've gone violent, we, with a rainbow, didn't get our rights this way. And I was like, bring this child to me I will, I will undo this work and I will try to undo the miseducation. And I'm ready for that. If that's a role I can play right now, then I'm, as a white person, also a queer person, also an anti-racist, also a feminist and a pacifist and a socialist and all the other things that I am, I'm, I'm, I'll do that work. And so I'll shut up, but offer anybody who's still on the call, if you're a white person, and you want to talk to somebody about this because you're awake now and having breakfast or you don't know where to go or you want to talk to some of your black friends about what to do, send me an email and we'll go from there. Well, thank you, panel. This has been uh, outstanding and that's all I can say. Uh, we have literally five minutes left. So um, I'm just going to let uh, you all make some closing comments if you would like, whatever closing comments you'd like to make. Um, uh, and then I'll wrap up at the very, very end. Um, but I just want to say, um, as you all are pulling those comments together, uh, thank you so much for this, for all of your contributions. Again, right, nobody wants to be on another diversity committee. And I'm often the one who has to ask people to be on those. But let me say this, I'm asking differently, because you all are right. It's just time and it's a different, it's time to, to do this differently. Um, and so, um, Whoever wants to uh, make some final comments, just uh, take your mic off and we will do that. And as I'm talking, we're four minutes. <laughs> Maybe no one wants to make a comment and that's okay too. I, I would like to. Please. Okay, go ahead, Jay. Um, I'm gonna read a passage really quickly and it's from um, Angela Davis if they come in the morning. And I feel this is an appropriate time, right? This is a time to, you know, what everyone has said. And thank you for Tim for saying what you said. I think we have to see that this is not about black people or white people. This is about all humanity. And I feel this, um, these words from James Baldwin to Angela Davis in her time of need are words that I feel we all need to really honor in this moment. And he says, we know that we, the Blacks, and not only we, the Blacks, have been and are the victims of a system whose only fuel is greed, whose only God is profit. We know that the fruits of this system have been ignorance, despair, and death. And we know that the system is doomed because the world can no longer afford it. 
if indeed it ever could have. And we know that for the perpetuation of this system, we have all been mercilessly brutalized and have been told nothing but lies, lies about ourselves and our kinsmen and our past and about love, life and death. So that both, that, so that both soul and body have been bound in hell. The enormous revolution in black consciousness which has occurred in your generation, my dear sister, means the beginning or the end of America. Some of us, white and black, know how great a price has already been paid to bring into existence a new people and unprecedented nation. If we know and do nothing, we are worse than the murderers hired in our name. Thank you, Jay. Dr. Greer, did you want to say something? Uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, but I also want to just tell people to read. We read to know we're not alone, but also so much of what we're experiencing is not new. And it's been written about eloquently uh, by especially Black scholars uh, for over 100 years now. Uh, and so we can find solace in the words of people who have weathered this storm before us. So I would say read. Thank you. Any final comments from Dr. Morgan or Dr. McCarthy? I would just second what Dr. Greer just said. Um, I've often in the past couple of days been asked where to start and you start on your bookshelf or, you know, at your virtual library um, and you figure out what has happened because this is not just about right here and right now. This is a long, long struggle. And um, we need to, uh, we need the work of allies who understand that this doesn't, hasn't just emerged out of nowhere. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all. Uh, we are literally at the time clock. So I'm gonna end with two quotes myself. Two of you, uh, some of you know that I have two favorite quotes that I usually use. And uh, one is of course, from Lela Watson, the indigenous Australian writer and activist. If you've come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. And then secondly, and uh, Baldwin, of course, has already been quoted, but everyone knows how I feel about Baldwin. So, you know, I can't leave without a little Baldwin. Um, so this is for, 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 our, for our allies. The world is before you. You need not take it as it was when you came in. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening to our panelists. I cannot thank you enough. I'll be thanking you for a very long time. I appreciate you. Please, everyone, continue to take care of yourselves. And please, thank your grocery worker. Thank your delivery person. Thank those essential people who are actually essential and keeping us safe, and those people who are often underlooked, overlooked and underserved. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.